Hello, and welcome back to the Guns on Pegs podcast. I hope those of you who have listened to episode one already have enjoyed it. If you've not heard it yet, what have you been doing? Go and listen to it now, then come back and listen to this one. Uh, we've got another fantastic episode lined up for you. But uh, first, I'm in a bit of a celebratory mood today. Chris, can you guess why? I've got an inkling, George. I've got an inkling, but I have a feeling that it doesn't relate to me so much. Go on. Yeah, I mean, obviously, we've all had the very good news that uh, lockdown's being lifted and we can all go out and shoot again come the beginning of December. I think this will we'll already be out shooting by the time this goes out, but I think it's worth mentioning at the, at the start. Uh, but then the other reason I'm celebrating today is because it's my birthday. Indeed. Indeed it is. <laughs> Your birthday news got trumped a bit by uh, by Matt Hancock, didn't it? <laughs> it did. I'm really glad to be enjoying a drink in the afternoon instead of doing any real work. So it's very nice. <laughs> Chris, I said we've got a good episode lined up. Do you want to tell us a little bit more? Yeah. So continuing with our theme, um, we this week we have the Sporting Agent episode. So our guest today is it as a chap who introduces people to essentially the best places in the shooting world what he doesn't know about shooting is not worth knowing and at the age of 22 he co-founded Roxton's the now rather famous sporting agency he now runs his own business taking clients to literally the best shoots in the world so today with us is my good friend Mark Firth welcome Mark hi thank you very much for asking me so last week we had Phil Burt on and I think you know Phil don't you I do know Phil. I have lots of very happy memories of Phil. Phil is as good an all-round shot on his day as I think I've ever seen. He, he, he's got gorgeous style. His timing is what it has to be, you know, if you're going to be that good, um, as good as it is. And he does it with a lovely sense of humour, a lovely quirky smile. The first time I ever met him was on a grouse moor on the North Yorks moors. And he was there with a bunch of Lincolnshire farmers who turned out to be all absolutely deadly, like Phil. And he said, Firthy, come in the back with me. He said, um, we can get to know each other. He said, and you can stuff cartridges for me. I thought, all right, fine. Perfectly happy to do that. So go in the butt. And he said, okay. He said, now what I like to do is leave a cartridge on the side of the butt for every grouse I miss. That way, he said, I pick up the rest and I know what I've got to um, collect. And I said to myself, you cocky bugger. Anyway, <laughs> at the end of the, it was quite a windy day. And at the end of the drive, there were seven cartridges sat on the side of the butt and a further 36 down in the bottom. <laughs> and he shot as well as that whenever I came across him. He didn't appear to have a bad day. Even after some of his legendary partying nights, he shot annoyingly well. I wish I'd ever learned the, the, the secret of that particular part of his success. <laughs> it's very good of you to give him such high praise. If you haven't heard the episode, as George alluded to at the start, Phil was our grouse shot episode, giving his tips away. So I think you should probably go and have listened to that if you haven't heard it. That's interesting. I, Phil was telling us last time what it is that he thinks makes a great grouse shot and what the great grouse shots have all got in common. What is it that you think about Phil that, that makes him such a fantastic shot now that he's not here. I tell you all the great grouse shots have got in common, so they do an awful lot of it. <laughs> and, and you can't be a great grouse shot without doing an awful lot of it. And I think what they have is they can relax. You know, you almost want, I think if you're shooting grouse particularly, you want, to, you want a relaxed aggression. You will never shoot well unless you really want to kill the bird. But at the same time, you've got to be leaning against the side of the bat, just not taking life too seriously. What you don't want to do is jump up and down with excitement every time you see a bird crossing the horizon at 300 yards, which is, mm. I still have to try and teach myself that sometimes. But I think what's quite interesting is that there are lots of great dry shots, there are lots of great high pheasant shots, and lots of great partridge shots. But there's very, very few people who are good at all three disciplines because they are so different. You know, one is a great, you know, a high pheasant shot, another is a great, you've got a great judge of distance and lead, and the bird, because no pheasants are flying straight. And, mm. and, and a grass is a very different thing because you've got to work out with the conditions, um, you've got to work out where your boundaries are, your safety boundaries, but also where you know you can safely shoot. And I always take a, a rangefinder to the butt with me so I can, you know, if it's, a, if it's a flattish horizon, I know exactly where 50 yards is. And you'll see the really great grass shots. Um, and I've been lucky to have shot with a few, and unlucky sometimes to have been drawn between a few of the better ones, which can be quite unnerving. Um, George Digweed once was in the next butt to me, and if I didn't sort something out at 40 yards, it was done for me. <laughs> with, with, with a Firthy, got you again. But you'll see the really great grass shots that if there's just one grass coming towards them, they'll let it in 20 yards and shoot it. If there's two grass coming towards them, 
They'll take the first one at 35 yards, the second one at 20 yards. And it's not making a fuss about it. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a very efficient art when you're very, very good at it. It's interesting what you say about um, having uh, like a high pheasant shot and a, and a part shot and a grouse shot. Um, I love it when you see the high pheasant shot try and shoot partridges in East Anglia. Mm. The wheels fall off <laughs> in a big way because it's just totally different. They're just not used to it, the, the sort of concept and the way you do it. Well, I was, I mean, I was, the only time I've ever been privileged enough to do it, I was asked by a chap called Paul Knights to go and shoot his wild partridges a few years ago in, in North Norfolk. We shot 162 brace oh. of wild partridges. The most amazing day. And I didn't shoot a right and left until the third drive because I, I was never used to a covey just star bursting all around you after you fired that first shot. And um, it was absolutely extraordinary. Never, it's one of those days I'll never, ever forget. It sounds amazing. I mean, partridges are just my favourite thing to shoot. As we discussed last time, I've never shot grouse, but I just can't get enough partridge at present. And I was chatting to somebody the other day and talking about, you know, the amount of money that people put into their grouse moors and the conservation benefits that that has is incredible. And if you could generate the same sort of social cachet around wild partridge shooting what an incredible pr coup that would be if people started pumping similar amounts of money into gray partridge conservation and the, all the knock-on benefits there you absolutely could of course the the, the, the one major difference is a gray small is heather so you look after the heather and you look after their environment of course with when you try and have gray partridges you have to change your entire farming program yeah uh, and th- that in itself is not just necessarily the, the always the cheapest thing to do, but also you often have conflicts with sort of um, farm managers and people like that. Uh, it's 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 a, it's a very brave thing to do, and I think also that um, your predator control has got to be incredibly carefully done because at the end of the day, you have to be on it the whole time. You 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 know, obviously you know everything you do within the law, but you have to be doing it. I mean, I remember when I shot that wild partridge place, I was introduced to the keeper and I said, so how do you do it? Somebody said, well, he won't tell you that, but he's known locally as the verminator. And this chap didn't just keep his own ground. He keepered, whether they wanted him to or not, about 10,000 acres round it as well. <laughs> and, and, uh, yeah. I, I don't think there were many foxes in that part of Norfolk. Yeah, the, I shot last year at, at, at Rutherfield in Hampshire and everything you're saying is, is sort of similar there. You know, you've got so many conflicts with the way that the estate needs to be run and the surrounding area and everything else. But obviously, if you can do it, it's awesome. But George, you're in the part of the world for it. If it, I mean, it, obviously, certain ground lends itself better as well. <laughs> Trust me, I'm campaigning hard for Dad to stop farming altogether. <laughs> just to do but, but, but I also think that you, you, uh, um, farming may be moving towards a, 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 an environment where it might be more um, practical to be able to do some of this. I think, with from what I understand of, of the new um, agriculture policies after Brexit, I think there will be more leeway to be able to to do some of the things that grey partridges need because at the moment what they've really suffered from is is, is pesticides and, and 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 lack of hedgerows and a lack of proper cover isn't it and, and and in theory that's only going to get better but also when all said and done you get a wet ascot week and all the work you've done is just tossed to the four winds isn't it as Prince yeah. Philip sort of described ocean racing, standing under a shower tearing on 50 pound notes. <laughs> and, and, and probably an element of wild partridges. Having said that, I do think that having a wild bird shoot, and particularly grouse because that's my most favourite thing of all, is the greatest of the games. It is, you know, you're, you are almost playing God. I mean, you can really, I mean, Phil Burt once um, s- said he could write the manual of running a grouse mall. Only got two words, they're check and book. And, and he's... Uh, <laughs> And, and, and you say, right, because everything you want to do, if you get permission, the new roads and everything else, it costs a fortune. But it's all worth yeah. it. It's all worth it in the end. Right. It's taken far too long to get to this point, but it's all been really interesting. <laughs> Mark, what's that you're drinking? I'm drinking a dry martini. Ooh. That's quite punchy for half past four on a Thursday afternoon. Well, you chose the time, not me. I was told to have a drink. And, 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 and Chris looks like he's drinking sort of slightly girly shandy. Is that right? I need to ask why you're drinking a dry martini. Why is that your drink of choice first, before I tell you mine? <laughs> well, it's my drink of choice because I thought I could top it up without having to leave the screen quite easily. <laughs> During lockdown one, Fiona and I would sort of repair out to the side of the lake at home and she'd have a large brand in ginger and I'd have a dry martini. And it just, it's got a one wonderful way it's the instant hit of just soothing the problems of the day to one side perfectly good choice then and i might have a stogie with it before the end of the um, before the end of the show oh go on what is it you've got there 
It's a Monte Cristo Petit Mondo. Oh. Um, I've done a lot of work in Cuba um, in my working life. And although I gave up smoking 29 years ago when my um, eldest son was born, or when actually my wife became pregnant with our, with our oldest son, but I started going to Cuba a lot with both the shooting and the fishing, which I was developing out there. And I have a sundowner with a mojito. It wasn't quite the same without a cigar. So yeah. I can go for a fortnight without smoking one, but then there are some times I need one a day. I, lo- I love a cigar. What does one shoot in Cuba, Mark? Cuba, first of all, it's got very, very good duck flighting because the uh, both the Mississippi and the Atlantic flyways in America both stop off in Cuba on the way down and the way back up again and in significant quantity. And um, they also have very good snipe shooting and they, and, and they have, to the surprise of Americans, I've mentioned it too, very, very good quail shooting. Because back in the 50s, when it was still the Las Vegas for America, they needed to have something to keep all the, the gambling tourists happy during the day. So they released quail all over sort of farmland that isn't say, within 100 miles of Havana. And, of course, come the revolution, the farming quality dived down, so it became ideal farming for, for wild birds. And at the same time, no local was going to waste such a valuable thing as a shotgun cartridge on such a small piece of meat as a, as a quail. And so they've absolutely blossomed. And I've been out there with sort of dog handlers and very good pointers. And we would bump 10 or 11 cubbies in a two-hour session. And if you, if you talk to an American about that with wild quail, they, 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 they struggle to believe you. Actually, it's quite a, f- a sweet story talking about the um, Cuban exploits, because when I was discussing the Cuban shooting with the commandante, um, not Castro, but one of his sidekicks who was in charge of the flora and fauna. And this chap was five foot six tall. He, for some reason, had a revolver strapped to his ankle. I think that was all part of his uniform. And I was there with my interpreter, and we were chatting away, and I'd been offered the whole of the southwest of Cuba, which was the best bit for the dark. And and he said, um, well, senor, he said, um, very exciting, and we're looking forward to working with you. He said, but I need to tell you that we are very ecologically minded. And I said, well, how does that manifest itself, Commandante? And he said, well, he said, we have very strict limits on the number of duck we allow people to shoot. And I said, well, what is that limit? And he said, well, it's 15. And I looked a bit crestfallen. And he said, what's the problem? He said, who could possibly want to eat more than 15 duck in a day? And so I said, well, it's not quite as so simple as that. I said, how do I persuade my clients who are going to Argentina, that they should, where they can shoot far more than that, that they should stop off and come to Cuba instead? And he said, oh, yes, I see what the problem is. And then we were, we were sort of uh, we were chatting away, and I suddenly said, ah, Commandante, I found a solution to our problem. He said, what is that solution? And I said, well, it's easier, they're not your duck. And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, they're Yankee duck. And a smile spread from ear to ear. <laughs> and, he, and, 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 and he turned to his interpreter, or uh, his psychic, and whispered something to him. I said to my chap, what's he saying? He's saying, clear the diary for tomorrow morning. We're rewriting the protocol on the Yankee duck shoot. <laughs> Uh, the word limit was removed forthwith. We we were very good boys. We actually, we, we, we limited our own guys. But yes, you could, I mean, it would be nothing to shoot a slab of cartridges on a morning duck fight. And the most the most exciting duck shooting I've ever done in my life. But presumably the demand for the meat as well, like at the end of it, you've got enough locals. Oh, who God, thinking, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. They'll, you'll be able to get but, rid of all of it. So there's not but, an issue yeah, at I all. suspect it will never be properly developed because the infrastructure in Cuba is in such poor shape that to get the boats, all the engines to get the, um, the the roads properly graded enough out to where you, the jump off points to go into the saltwater lagoons where these things are and everything else is is such that it won't happen. So these duck will be safe as houses. I mean, I know because I was very involved from the start with the developing the bone fishing out there with some Italian friends uh, in the Jardines de la Reina, which is off South Cuba, and the logistics involved with getting that operation going. It's been absolutely extraordinary. Well, look, uh, th- this, this explains to you uh, where it marks level of experience, doesn't it? It goes it goes far, and we've only just got started, so fascinating. Um, George, we haven't actually heard what you're drinking. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I would started off on uh, one of the beers that you very kindly sent me for my birthday, Chris. I had a, a Harvey Stoon Brewery Stout, but I've got about an inch of it left, and I anticipated this eventuality. So I've also got... A wee dram of whiskey as well, just to wash it down. <laughs> oh, you good man. I'm making a mistake with these podcasts of not lining up enough drinks next to me. <laughs> I thought that one through. <laughs> you, 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 you can fit a lot of dry martini into that, you see. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, you've got to, he's, he's got a big shaker in front of him. 
I need to invest in a in a fridge underneath the desk. That's going to be the next purchase. Chris, what have you got in your glass today? I have gone one up from last week's horror. And this week, uh, I've got an old Rosie, which is a rather horrendous cider for those of you that know about it. Uh, the old Rosie is a firm favorite in my in my family who, who likes a get together at the pub. So this is it actually started when I was at uni, but our favorite for drinking old Rosie is actually at the Smugglers in St. Brellard in Jersey, down on the beach. So we go there, usually over Christmas, which we won't be able to do this year. I don't think. Uh, and uh, yeah, an old Rosie has just got very fond memories from various family shoot days and whatnot or nights before and so on. So yeah, it's got a steamroller on the front and I can only assume that that is effectively what it does to you. <laughs> <laughs> you just showed us the bottle on the video, but um, uh, I was going to ask, is, Ro- is old Rosie the one that normally comes in a ceramic jug? Yeah, it you know, like the one that they ask you when we were at uni, they, they would only serve it in half pints because they couldn't trust us. But, you know, when you ask for an old Rosie, they sort of look at you and go, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> this is one of them. Right. Well, should we move on then now that we've got the important bit done? We should. OK, so those of you who were listening last time will know that we have a new feature for this series. It's called Whose Bird Is It Anyway? Which is where the three of us are going to try and resolve your shooting dilemmas. This one was sent in to us by somebody we're calling Barry. Obviously, that's a made-up name. Don't want to get anyone in trouble. He sent it in after the last episode, and it's a retrospective dilemma in that the decision's been made, but he wants to know whether he made the right choice. So first of all, here's the dilemma. Barry writes, The dilemma arose because I had a day booked on the first Saturday of lockdown 2.0, which had to be cancelled. I got a call on the Sunday morning from the keeper to say that we could move the day to the Monday before lockdown began the very next day, but not the Tuesday or the Wednesday. The Monday was the one day that week I had a client meeting. I could have asked someone else to cover and had no doubt that the client wouldn't have minded. But I had no time to clear it with the client in advance. And of course, the reason for missing it was for shooting, not for a medical appointment or some other professional engagement. What should I have done? Should I have given my peg to someone else? Thrown a sickie? been upfront about the reasons and potentially risk an irate client and boss? Should I have gone shooting but joined the meeting from the field and risked upsetting my fellow guns? What would you have done in my position? Mark, what's your take? (laughs) I think it's quite simple. In all these things, I think we all instinctively know what the right thing is to do. It's never the easiest or the cheapest, but the right thing, the right thing (laughs) simply is not to have gone shooting. Because if he had gone shooting, if he's a proper person, which I suspect he is, he would have felt guilty all day long about telling Porky's to get out of what he should have been doing and probably have shot really badly as a result. So, and in every sense, I think it's it's rather like um, you should always accept the first invitation. That was important. Uh, you couldn't get out of it politely at that notice. He did the correct, he, the correct thing to do was not to go shooting. Mark, I did not expect that from you. <laughs> You surprised me. I'm an old fart now, Chris, you see. So. <laughs> um, oh, God, I'm going to set a precedent for the team now. For whatever I say, the next shooting invite that comes up, <laughs> pull a sickie is going to be straight in there, isn't it? <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it really, I think what we don't have here in this information is what his profession is. I mean, if he's a, if he's a heart surgeon, I should probably, <laughs> I think he should probably, yeah. Go to work. If if he's an estate agent, don't bother. Like absolutely go shooting. So I, I'm gonna I'm gonna sit slightly on the fence and say that where possible, go shooting. And then uh, as we said last week, you know, just just sort of go with it and uh, ask answer questions later. Well, I mean, I I probably shouldn't say this, but you having said already that you view it as Preston, I've got slightly less worries about it. I'm throwing a sickie. <laughs> no question. <laughs> Noted, noted heavily. <laughs> I believe that when, when John, well, all the, the many decades he was editing the field, Jonathan Young told me that any day fe- um, spent in the field, fishing or shooting or hunting, whatever, did not count as a day's holiday. Yes, now I've been saying this <laughs> since the day I joined Guns on Pegs. It's research. There you go. Yeah, we're, we're fairly flexible towards this, I think. George, it presumably all depends on your numbers at the end of the session. If your numbers look great, you can get away with it. If your numbers are a bit dodgy, then um, I suspect the review might be somewhat different. <laughs> do, do we know what Barry does as a job? Well, do you want the resolution? Do you want to know what he actually decided? Yeah, I want to know how well this turned out for him. Yeah. So after he'd sent it, I, I replied and just asked for a bit more information. So this is what he sent back. He said, 
because I'm a lawyer, I'm naturally fairly averse Ooh. to client complaints or concerns about the treatment of a client, particularly in the current climate. So in the end, I decided not to go and my peg was eagerly snapped up by someone else. Fortunately, I didn't end up out of pocket, but I did sit through the entire meeting feeling pretty glum. The worst thing about the whole affair is that there is a beautifully produced 15 minute film on YouTube of the whole day so I can see exactly what I missed. <laughs> oh, but so, but Firthy got it right for once. He did. Yeah, Firthy, you're spot on there. <laughs> so he's a lawyer. You see, I, it's, not, it's not quite open heart surgery, but it's, it's still fairly, it could be fairly important. So, so Barry gets. Yeah, Garters, the exclusive Guns on Pegs podcast garters on their way to Barry. And Chris, we've had some more correspondence after their episode one as well, haven't we? Are these garters, are, are, they, are they as important as a Radio 1 t-shirt and pen? <laughs> the old Radio 1 t-shirt and pen. Uh, well, these garters are very, they are, they are the most important gift that any shooting person can receive, Mark. And do you know what? You will have a pair in the post very soon. Good Lord. There is a pair coming to you. So they are pink strapped garters with navy and oatmeal tassels. Uh, so they're quite quite garish, but uh, but they are very they they look awesome. Uh, and anyway, our guests and anyone who makes it onto the podcast gets a set. So um, we have also had correspondence from Paddy from the from the Serengeti. Paddy was driving across the plains of Serengeti. Uh, in Tanzania, uh, listening to our podcast. So, dear old Paddy, uh, that's pretty awesome. I think we've had a, a further, uh, a further listener than that uh, since the last episode. So, a, a, a pair of garters is on their way to him. Um, do we do we have an address? Sort of just past the rock, down the dusty track. Is that, is that, is that where we're sending them? Paddy Serengeti, Africa. Is that the address? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Well, we'll see if they get there. There's probably quite a lot of paddies there. You might need a surname. (laughs) If you are listening and you are somewhere that isn't the Serengeti, let us know. I think it'd be really interesting to know if we've got anybody listening in like in continental Europe or in the States. It'd be really interesting to know. So if you are in one of those two places, drop us an email, let us know, and we'll get some garters in the post to you. You also you also ought to think about a feature of the, the most obscure place somebody's been shooting. I I took a team woodcock and snipe shooting in Iran a few years ago. Uh, that was quite an experience. Okay, if you can beat Iran, <laughs> email us pod at gunsonpegs.com and let us know. And let me tell you, getting guns and cartridges into Tehran was much easier than getting back into Heathrow at the end of it all. <laughs> that, that's absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> So, Mark, uh, we must we must ask you a bit about the sporting agent world. But before I do, we've got to touch on some common ground of you and I, uh, the Country Food Trust, of which we are both trustees, very proud trustees of that. Um, just thought, yeah, maybe you can give us a quick update. Uh, we, we've had a recent meeting, so it's uh, it's all going absolutely swimmingly well, isn't well, it? Well, I think it is going very well. Um, and I think it, we seem to have broken through what I call the critical mass barrier, where support comes to us as much as one going out and looking for it, which which is which means we must be getting something right. I think also the development into venison, particularly when it's shot, well, I spent, well because we only buy venison that's shot with copper ammunition, which means we can feed it to children. And right at the moment, um, that is ticking a lot of boxes, not just for us, but for an awful lot of other people too. And with our with our important partners, such as Fair Share and the Trussell Trust and other people, um, this is really becoming a, a fascinating development of what we're doing. And yes, as you as you say, Chris, there's so much to be proud of. Uh, and what I love about the, the Country Food Trust is it's not a shooting charity. It's a charity that feed the homeless. But it's very much supported at the moment by Colorado Shooting People. And, and I think it, it can only put shooting sportsmen in a good light at the end of the day, too. So we're not there as a shooting organisation. We're there as a feeding the homeless organ- or f- feeding the needy organisation. But, you know, it's, it's, it's a very important job we're doing. And I've always wanted to, um, you know, do uh, put something back. And Chris is... I gather taking over from me in a role I spent 10 years doing was being on the board of the Countryside Alliance, representing the shooting industry on that. And at the time, I was the only person who knew what a shotgun looked on that board, looked like on that board. They mostly <laughs> spent most of their time on a horse. That's, that's not fair. That's, I'm, I'm very much overplaying that. But I, I was probably the only person who knew how the shooting industry worked. 
And I think it's a bit different to that now. But again, it's, you know, uh, there are precious few people who put something back. And I think it's a terribly important thing to do that because, you know, it's, it, you know, you can sleep at night and, and you know that you perhaps, you know, if you tossed off this mortal coal tomorrow, the, the work you've done has been of some benefit to people other than oneself. Indeed. And it's, and, I mean, the, the CFT, the Country Food Trust, is now fed, uh, was delivered 1.6 million meals to people in need, uh, for those who haven't been aware of the progress. So it's it's absolutely awesome. And as you, as you alluded to, the Venison Project, uh, specifically for children, has been been wonderful. I mean, not least, obviously, this this whole uh, situation has been driven somewhat by the likes of Marcus Rashford and, and the, the things he's doing. And that's actually played into our hands in uh, in terms of sort of press and, and getting everything out there and the number of donations that have been coming in. So please do keep them coming. The The Winter Appeal is open at the moment. You can donate and join the raffle and all sorts. So yeah, really And if good. I can add one thing to what Chris just said, things to really, really remember at the Country Food Trust is every single pound feeds a person. So if yeah. you can spare 20 quid, you fed 20 meals. And, you know, that's quite something. And we can all spare 20 quid every now and again. Absolutely. And Chris, um, Chris, I, when I first joined Guns on Pegs just over a year ago, I remember you talking about the idea of being pheasant neutral, net zero pheasants. Well, it's something that we're, we're starting. I mean, we, we, we actually, we'd really like to do something really proper with this, you know, a bit more, bit of technology or something. So people have a way that they could log, you know, their days in a sort of, sort of game card almost and, and then donate. But uh, yeah, to put it simply, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of people out there, certainly our founding trustee, Andrew, and, and, and actually Phil Spencer as well. I know he's doing this. What, what you do is, is for every bird that you shoot over the course season, just just tally it up and and halfway through the season or mid um, you know whenever at the end of the season just just make a donation to the country food trust for all the birds that you shoot and then and obviously a pound per bird so so what you're knowing then is that every bird that you've shot is going into the food chain you're guaranteeing that isn't it yeah it's, yeah basically yeah because the country food trust is buying so much game now from from various different places that yes that is exactly what's happening and don't forget to count all those birds you share with somebody else too <laughs> Uh, that's very important. <laughs> that's that's about <laughs> half of mine. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So, Mark, this episode is the sporting agent episode, and often in these podcasts, my role is to play that of the uh, of the, the the benign idiot. So, um, <laughs> can you explain to me what it is that a sporting agent actually does, in case anybody listening? It doesn't quite understand how it all works. A sporting agent um, connects a somebody who wishes to buy a day shooting, be it for a whole team or for one gun, with a provider, um, an estate, a syndicate, what they're sometimes called commercial shoots. And the skill of the sporting agent will be to put the right people in the right place, to, to not put square pegs in round holes, and to make sure that the person on the buying end of the equation gets at least what he's looking for or more. So the expectation should never be too great. You should always, hopefully, um, you know, exceed expectations. Now, you know, shooting is a wild sport in many ways, and it's impossible to guarantee things. But you, it's, it's predictable enough, if you know enough about it, not to get it wrong too often. And when it does go wrong, the key is that the, the agent should always have been present so that he can see what has actually happened. Um, because it, I can assure you, if you're not there, the guns will ring up and say, well, there weren't any birds. And the owner will ring up and say, well, they couldn't shoot a barn door from five paces. And it's quite difficult to find out who's telling the truth. So you actually have to, uh, you know, you can't let a day shooting just sitting in your office. It doesn't work. So, so what does it take to be a great sporting agent then? What, what is it set, sets them? Don't ask me. Um, no. <laughs> you, you've obviously proven it. So. Um, do you know what? I, I, I think you've got to love people. And you've got to love people and you've got to really understand people and you've got to work out what they're thinking before they've started thinking it. So you can, you know, like head situations up at the past and that sort of thing. And you've got to understand that you your relationship with the keepers is in, is very different, but very just as important as with the the owner or whoever's shoot it is. And you've got to have um, the knowledge to know about the different drives on a shoot. And you don't always get it. If you get at every shoot and say, "Oh, these guys are all amazing," so only give them the highest drives, and they turn around and and you know 
they, they, they really can't perform at all in those drives. Nobody will thank you for it. Um, so it's it, it, you've got to get it right, and you've got to do the right thing, and you've got to and, and you've got to think as they with you paying the bill all the time. How would I feel in these circumstances? And above all, actually, you've got to care. And as long as you care, mm. and as long as you make the effort, and as long as you do everything that can humanly be done, it should go right for you. And I've been lucky. I've been lucky because I've been doing it for thick end of forty years. I arranged my first day in two thousand. In 1982, so that's 38 years. And yes, I mean, you, 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 so, I, mean I know, I know where all the sky is, where the skeleton sprayed. I know, I know so many shoots. I always say to people, even if you're not buying a day from me, ask me about a shoot, and I'll tell you honestly. And if I don't know the shoot within two minutes, I'll know somebody who does. Um, mm. And you know, and it means that I mean, I listen. I sold out of Roxton's Scosh in 2005. So and then I went I went back into the game about seven or eight years later, purely because I missed the people. I didn't need to see another grouse yeah. shot or another pheasant shot. I just really missed being with my friends. And enough of my old clients said, Firthy, please, please will you come back and look after us? And after it, I thought, well, why not? And also by that time we had our family trout farm and we had also have a smokery in Bridport called Chelsea Smokery. And the managers of both said, oh, stop looking over our shoulder, go and do something else. And so it also combined quite neatly to go back into it. And I've loved it. I mean, I do it, gosh, and I'll do it 60 or 70 days a year. Not this year, I hasten to do it, but in a normal year, I'll do that. And mm. um, and actually, often I'll spend the thick end of a month up on the grass, which I adore. I mean, who wouldn't want to be in the Pennines or Scotland between you know, in August and September? And, and I'll often have a lot of my work finished by um, late November. I can really see what you mean about when you when you say, uh, you know, being amongst friends and, and just really loving the people. And if you're lucky enough to be on Firthy's mailing list, <laughs> his his emails that go out on a monthly basis, I think are absolute gold. They're just you literally chatting to your mates in email form, but sort of publicly. It's quite funny. Uh, so, uh, yeah, if it, I, I won't encourage people to go and sign up because you probably won't let them on. Oh, no, well, they, they, but, they, uh, they please do. If they send me, they, 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 <laughs> ask via you and I'll happy let them on. You know, no problem at all. I mean, it's called <laughs> spreading work. And it's it's not it's not a sa- it's not a sales thing at all. It's just having a sardonic look um, at matters sporting. I mean, we normally I have a, a regular paragraph called Pack and Watch, uh, where, we, where where we discuss his latest joy and a few things like that. So yeah, it's, it's sort of um, you know there's the odd sort of bit that apparently makes people smile. So Mark, I think you you might have sort of slightly answered some of this before, but I've got a slightly cheeky question for you which is how is it that sporting agents have avoided being tarred with a similar brush to estate agents? <laughs> um, well, I, got, I, I could answer this in an awful lot of ways, couldn't I? Um, I, th- <laughs> I, think a go- I think a good agent is always worth his corn. A good estate agent, a good sporting agent, and I'm sure equally there are some very dodgy sporting agents and estate agents out there. It's about the person, and I think if people learn to trust you, that's the key. They trust you and they know you care and they, they know you will go the extra mile to make sure that what they want is done, that, that that's how it works. But, you know, it's quite funny. I, I was chatting away to someone the other day and we were talking about how things have changed in um, since I first learned day in 1982. And I remember in 1983, um, I was um, sitting behind my desk at Roxon's um, opposite my co-conspirator Chris Orsich with whom I founded it um, we uh, and somebody who I've been chasing led us some days rang up and said well you know Firthy okay fine I will give you a couple of days but you're not gonna like the price and I said okay fine hit me with it and he said I want 10 quid a bird net to me so I put my hand over the end of the phone and I looked over at Chris and said he's gone bonkers so whatever he's smoking but you give me some I said because there's no way anybody's going to pay that and look what they're paying now I mean it's absolutely extraordinary how, how that has changed because back in the old days um, very very few very little of what we now look as the let shoots were, were were letting days at all it was historically all the let days were happening on grouse and stalking in Scotland and everything else the the, the, the low ground pheasant approaches were kept by people for themselves and when in the early 80s people started letting the odd day, they, it was almost some people could accuse them of, of sort of being like a prostitute and, and they were wiped off the local drinks party circuit. That's sort of thing. Uh, again, how that's changed. It's mad, isn't yeah. it? It really is. Yeah. And, 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 and do you think that 
that's just that's sort of more more of a sort of general global movement in terms of sort of wealth, as it were, and and the uh, cost. I, I of think things also and... I think um, that you have a lot of people in Belgium and in America and France and Spain, whatever, who have had a great history of shooting, but not necessarily in their country. And your typical foreign sportsman has probably shot things all over the world. You can't really say that about your typical British sportsman. We've been a bit more sort of mm. uh, parochial than that. But, you know, I, I mean, I've had team, I've had French teams who I've known for 35 years who shoot with their father's purdies. And then, frankly, they're more British than we are. They're, they're often rather better turned out than we are. And, of course, the Americans love coming here because fishing and shooting, we, we are, as far as they're concerned, the, the, you know, not just their birthplace in terms of um, where their forefathers may have come from, but also they love that whole, all the history, the sepia photographs of shooting and everything else of, you know, Edward VII, uh, surrounded by piles of dead pheasants and five loaders. Uh, they love that bit. And so they really enjoy coming over and partaking in that. And mm. it's thank God all these guys do, because if you look at the way let shooting runs, you'll find that the larger earlier days are taken by the foreigners. And that's where a lot of the costs get covered on shoot, which then allows the locals to come in and have the sort of smaller later days. And it's a system that really works very well. It's so true. We notice it on Guns on Pegs, you know, tr- trying to sell earlier days in the season on on well, pheasant and partridge days uh, to, to British people is is actually quite tricky, and and there's a, just a huge desire for January shooting, and I've never really quite understood it because I personally, if I had a choice, wouldn't be January, but um, you, me, it, me too. it's more of a culture thing. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe is it is it just a sort of fashion? Um, I, I, I get, well, they, everybody always assumes that birds fly higher and better in January. I don't think that's necessarily true. It may be true on a lightly shot shoot, but a shoot that's mm. shot remotely. Not heavily is the wrong word, but it shoot that's shot to its that its capacity. Uh, by the time you get to January, you're all second half of January. You're often a lot of the birds see the ones that have flown low to avoid being shot at all season. Get out the sides because that's how they've got away with it all season. And the really good high birds have been shot by the time yeah. you got there. So I'm not sure that January is always the best. Well, we reckon there are eleven thousand shoots in the country, and of that, uh, around. Eight to nine thousand of those are particularly small, yeah, like particularly small, and so maybe that is where the January fashion comes from. Yeah. Because if if you've got guns shooting at the vast majority of shoots, all talking about the best days being in January, I can see how it comes about. But if you're going to a larger shoot, get there in November. Just- and also, I can tell you, uh, as I can tell you, you know, uh, as a sporting agent, I mean, I hate January because you're very often. I, I, I hate playing hunt the pheasant. It's a nightmare. And you'll find you get down to this shoot and it's been rain- raining for the last four days. And the day you get there, the sun's come out. And what little is there is running up and down every hedgerow at 100 miles an hour, not staying in the drives where they're supposed to be and all that sort of thing. It just, it, and, and do you know what? I like predictability. Um, as an agent, I like to know what's going to happen. And um, the, you know, that's another reason why I find January quite frustrating sometimes. So that's, that's probably got that's probably get, that's probably got um, a lot of hate mail coming in my direction, I suppose. But um, that's 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 decades of experience coming out there, I'm afraid. Well, so Mark, <laughs> in those decades of experience, you must have fielded some pretty unusual requests from clients, or extravagant, or whatever, either shooting related or extracurricular. Are there any? that you feel you can share with us? <laughs> well, there's probably one or two I can't, although um, I've never have arranged anything like that, I hasten to add. And, and that's <laughs> genuine. I remember once we had a very splendid Brazilian shooting with us back in the mid-80s. And he said, Mark, he said, I'm a terrible state. He said, I can't find my favourite cigarettes over here. Can you see if you can, if they're available in England? And, and um, of course, they didn't have the internet those days, so I made a few calls. And these particular cigarettes could not be found anywhere in England or indeed in Europe. So like any good flamboyant Brazilian, he sent his plane and his pilot back to Rio to pick up a few cartons for him to get to, to get back as quick as he could. Goodness me. I tell you, not, oh I, that is completely true. He must really like those cigarettes. Oh my God. <laughs> um, I can, uh, so th- there was a, I, I know of another occasion, I wasn't organising it, when there were three people fishing in Russia. And the fishing wasn't very good, so they decided to go early. 
and um, and they agreed to um, get together and hire a plane. Um, so this plane flew out to Murmansk, and they specially chartered the camp's helicopter to take them in so one day early. In ordering the plane, two of them wanted to go to North Hilt and one wanted to go to Farnborough. And the guys at North Hilt saying, well, listen, there's two of us want to go to North Hilt. We'll go to North Hilt because, you know, the majority wins. So the guy was a bit sort of, he didn't say very much. When they arrived at Murmansk, there were two planes so that he could go back to Farnborough himself without taking a taxi from North Hilt. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, Honestly, where do you find these I people? Don't know. I don't know. It's, a, it's a completely extraordinary. It reminds me of the story of an Italian chap who who you probably know, actually, so I'll mention it off air because his name certainly cannot be mentioned with this story. Uh, and he landed his plane very early in the morning. Uh, he was shooting up north and he came from Italy very early in the morning, landed at City Airport to pick up all his stuff, which was housed in London. And his driver was waiting there for him with all his stuff. He, he, he picked it up, obviously paid a hefty landing fee to land at City Airport first thing in the morning. Uh, and they got in the plane, took off and realised he'd forgotten to collect his dog as well so he he ordered the pilot to stop and land again paying another hefty landing fee at city airport at 7 (laughs) a.m to pick up his labrador to put back in the plane to go back up to the (laughs) shoot honestly i just what so the so the labrador was just sort of milling around in departures (laughs) can you god Um, so you, you talked about um, a bit of the history. I, I, I loved your comment on the ten pound pheasant being absolutely ridiculous. I think it's so funny. But I think the sort of the whole shooting landscape has completely changed, hasn't it? Yes. You no, know, right, right from sort of hospitality to culture and the sort of the fashions over high pheasants and everything else. You, you must be able to sort of share a bit of that and maybe put some perspective on the current situation. Yeah, I mean, high pheasants are a funny old thing. I first started letting shooting on Exmoor in 1982, 83, sorry, 83. And that's really where much of the cult of high pheasant shooting started. Um, Alan Milton coincidentally had a shoot called Milton's. There was no connection. And she was like Castle Hill. And then... Um, I helped get a shoot called Hadio going with a track called Ned Goshen, an old friend of mine who, who owned some of the land and got the other land. And then Chargat came along and then Molland and West Molland and North Molton. And there, uh, it's, there is some, there's land on which you take a genius to show a low pheasant down there. <laughs> and, but I do worry occasionally that it's gone quite, it's a little too far. Um, I, I think if more than 20% of the birds you show on a drive are likely to be out of the effective range of a standard shotgun and cartridges, then I think you really need to think about whether you should be doing that drive or not. I, I, do, get, yeah, I, I, I do get nervous as to potential cruelty issues where you can't really kill birds properly. And mm. two years ago, I went into our local gunsmiths and I saw a pile of cartridges. I think I'm right in saying there were 43 gram fours. And I thought, do you know what, 43 gram fours. And I thought, you know, if you are going to start, if that's what you're using. Back in the old days, people used to use a Rottweil Tiger. And, and that was pretty fierce. And they would put it in old English game guns. And you could almost see the gun jumping out of the chap's hands when he pulled the trigger. I think we used to joke that the cartridge on the, on the box, the cartridge on the side, said, do not fire when standing in marshy ground. Um <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I think you know I need to be able to enjoy myself. I don't get shooting. I'm not trying to prove a point. I, I know if God's in His heaven, uh, if I behave the night before, um, etc., etc., I'm capable of sort of not totally disgracing myself. Um, but you know, I, I don't want to it, it, to fill to fire thirty four gram fives or, or whatever it is all day long in a gun that's weighing thick end of ten pounds is not my definition of enjoyment. It has gone that way, hasn't it? Well, it's funny. I don't. I don't think it will stay there forever. I really don't. I've got one theory that um, some of these high falutin high bird shoots is a, a, a lot of people love going to them because they are told from the moment they start learning how to shoot that these are the best places, and so they want well, these guys can afford to go to the best, so they want to go to the best, and of course, and they often arrive there with their pet instructor, and pet instructor. If you've got a very- <laughs> <laughs> if, if, if you've got a very high bird that's coming from quite a long way, the pen instructor can say left a bit, right a bit, up a bit, down a bit. Hang on a moment. Okay, fire. It, because it's so, because the, you know there's so much time, and the high bird gives them a chance to do that. 
you know, snap shooting in a wood. The structure is almost, you know, there's, nothing, there's no real benefit. I think you can add in quite the same way. So that's the old bit of cynicism for, for um, I'm going to get a lot of trouble with the instructors now. So, um. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't worry. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> <laughs> but having said that, you know, the, these are they are great shoots, and you know, and I think even they are realizing that you can't do all the high drives, all the silly drives all the time. I, another interesting point about these high person shoots is uh, there's a drive at Hadia called Pixie's Cox, which is one of the highest drives, and as, the, the range of the pheasants over the guns is about 50 to 60 odd yards, but that is straight above you. And I worked that out with a rangefinder. I also worked out with that same rangefinder that if if the bird was more than five degrees left or right or back or forwards from you, the distance was was so much greater than that that the odds on you actually hitting it cleanly were were, were, mm. were so much smaller. So really, if you are shooting really high pheasants, do make sure that you shoot them perpendicularly over your head. My it's Firthy's tip. Very there nice. you go. There's another top tip to follow on from uh, grouse shooting tips last time. Don't try and shoot your neighbours because you'll make a fool of yourself and you won't do it. There's another <laughs> lesson I need to learn. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Mark, I think that's all been really fascinating. And uh, it's interesting to hear you talk about your um, your preferences shooting wise. So the way we like to wrap up this particular kind of segment of the podcast is to ask, what your desert island shooting would be. So if you've got one day to shoot, it's your last one ever, what are you doing? Where are you going? Who are you with? Money's no object. I think I had that day this year. Um, oh. I was very, incredibly lucky. I was asked to shoot at Weirdell, which is a more owned by a mutual friend of Chris and I. And um, with for good COVID reasons, we were shooting with single guns, and we there was a, a very a, a strong wind verging on very strong wind all day long. We did four drives through the drives or with the wind. One was across across the wind, and shooting single guns was 195 brace of the best grass I've shot for a very long time. And I went to the keeper at the end of the day, who I know very well. I, I like to think he's a good friend of mine. And I said, you know what, Nick? I said, if I never see another day shooting, I've had today. And, oh. I, and so I'm incredibly lucky. I've, I've had, I've had, you know, but also I think when you think about it, and, and again, it's sort of, you know, um, me being an old fart, you think more about these things. I, often the most exceptional days, the ones you remember are often the ones that were surprisingly good which by definition means they're often wild. I remember being asked to go, um, I was shooting at Gunnerside with Bob Miller um, one year in on shooting his pheasants in late November. And he rang and he said, Firthy, any chance you can get here a day early um, because um, we're going to have a last go at the grouse. And I got there, I couldn't get up there the night before, um, so I left at sort of maybe three o'clock in the morning. And I arrived at the lodge and the breakfast table was set for three. Oh, God, how embarrassing. I've got obviously got it all wrong and I shouldn't be here and everything else. I wasn't wrong. It was Bob, myself, and one other person. And to three of us, <laughs> on the 23rd of November, we shot 75 brace of grouse. And that was extraordinary. Um, oh, you, know, you are a lucky chef, aren't uh, you? <laughs> and then Dan, another amazing time with um, Edward Dashwood, and there were four of us down on his very special shoot in Wales, which is basically a woodcock shoot. And I think we shot 35 on woodcock, about 20 snipe, and another 60 teal and widgeon flighting in the evening to four of us. Now, how do you, how do you ever improve on a day like that? You see, your desert island shooting weekend would be to go through those places just by helicopter. Yeah, but it also, it's, as you say, you can't do it on your own. It's got to be with your mates and all that. Yeah, indeed. Um, that, that is the key point, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. <laughs> it's got nothing to do with the places, really, has it? Uh, I think that they, 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 no, they, they have something to do with it. I'd rather shoot my mates on a good place than a bad place. Uh, <laughs> yeah, assuming that they could be there. Well, look, 
Mark, it's been it's been an absolute joy to have you with us. I, I love I love hearing the stories. I also love learning a thing or two from you about about where this all began and 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 the sort of situation we find ourselves in now. So thank you so much for for joining us. But next week, uh, we we've got our celebrity shot episode. So we've got an absolute pro of media on, which is quite daunting for us. We've got got someone who's very used to talking to a microphone. I'm a bit worried that I'm going to be <laughs> unable to speak. So this celebrity shot we've got joining us is is David. Gower uh, and so um, yeah he uh, George being a big well we're both big cricket fans aren't we but uh, I, I have met David once before which will take the nerves off very slightly uh, we shared the stage at the World Gun Makers evening once uh, which was really good laugh but George I can't wait to see you well, well I'm gonna have to have a couple of pre-drinks I think just to calm the nerves <laughs> but Chris I, I believe you and I are also shooting together with David um, in January we're not we are. This is. This got even more exciting. I only found out about that uh, yesterday. Um, so uh, <laughs> it's going to be awesome. So we'll look forward. Look forward to chatting to David. Um, but anyway, thank you so much, Mark, for joining us. Absolutely. Yeah. So all that remains for me to say is to also add my thanks to Chris and to Mark for joining us, and to thank everybody else for listening. We hope you're enjoying the new series. Before we go, there's another final reminder that you can get your hands on a pair of these exclusive Guns on Pegs podcast shooting sock garters by sending us your dilemmas to resolve, by emailing us to let us know where you're listening from, what you're doing when you're listening. And what was the other one that we've added today? Oh, yes, the the, the most exotic place that you've been shooting. So uh, if you've got any of those to tell us or if you just want to tell us who you've been sharing the podcast with, Drop us an email to pod at gunsonpegs.com. And if we read it out in the next episode or one of the subsequent episodes, we'll send you some garters. Until the next episode, thanks very much for listening and goodbye. Very nice. Is that all right? Cool. Yeah, that's brilliant. That's really good. I enjoyed that. 